There are 249 town meeting members. 125 constitutes a quorum. The constable informs me that a quorum is present. Session three of the November 6th, 2017 special town meeting will now come to order. Quick schedule review. If we don't finish tonight, we are next scheduled for Wednesday, November 15th, but um, it should be a reasonable thing for us to finish our business tonight. Please try and be quiet as you're getting to your seats. Seats on the floor of the auditorium may be occupied only by town meeting members, except for the front row, which may be used by members of the press and members of town committees and town staff. Such persons must wear non-voter stickers, which are available at the check-in tables. The seats in front of me on the right are occupied by the select board, town manager, assistant town manager, finance directors, um, and assistant to the town manager, IT staff, and the planning board is seated to my left because our first two articles that we're dealing with are zoning articles. Spectators and town residents who are not town meeting members may be seated in the bleachers to the rear of the auditorium. New information for town meeting members can be found on the back table to my left. Old information can be found on the back table to my right. Amherst Media provides gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of our proceedings on public access channel 17. I'd like to thank their staff and volunteers. If you wish to speak, you must raise your hand and be recognized. You must hold up a card to indicate your position. Green indicates yes, red indicates no, and a white card indicates that either you wish to speak without advocacy, or you wish to ask a question, or you wish to make a motion. When you're called on, please first state your name and precinct. If you forget, I will interrupt you and ask you to do so. If you need more than three minutes or more than five when speaking to a motion that you have made, you must request additional time before speaking, and town meeting will vote on your request. If you're speaking from the floor, please speak into a microphone that will be provided once you're recognized. This will allow viewers outside the auditorium to hear you. The microphone will be on when it is handed to you. Please hold it close to your mouth when you speak. And I would like to especially thank our two microphone wranglers who volunteered to do this important task. Non-members who wish to speak should stand at the rear of the right-hand aisle, the aisle in front of me. Any registered voter of the town of Amherst who is recognized by the moderator may speak without special permission. Others may speak with the permission of a majority. If you're making an amendment to a motion, the amendment must be presented in writing with four copies submitted to the front table. Procedural motions, such as a motion to refer or a motion to dismiss, do not need to be presented in writing. If you make any motion from the floor, it must be the first thing you do after you have been recognized and have identified yourself. You cannot speak first and then make a motion. If you've not already done so, please check your cell phone, make sure it is silenced or off. If at any point in time you're confused about the proceedings, it is appropriate to call a point of order and ask for a clarification. A couple extra reminders. Um, please take a quick peek at your electronic voting device and make sure it's the number that looks familiar that's the same number device you got last time. If you think you have an incorrect number, go back to the check-in table and talk to them. So I've also been warned that if you head off that way to the bathrooms towards where the pool and the gym are, and if you go through the doors and they close behind you, you will be locked into that corridor. Um, <laughs> You wouldn't, you know, you'd live because you'd have to go outside and around and come back in. But be careful if you go that way to make sure the doors are still propped open so you can come back. Um, we are now going to do a quick test of our electronic voting devices. First, a couple quick reminders. Up, oh, keys. Not mine. This looks like a, is that a Prius? Oh, it's a, Toyota a Toyota key with a stop and shop tag. This, could, this, this narrows it down to three quarters of you. <laughs> Hampshire Athletic Club tag, that narrows it down to like 60%. So, Toyota key, if you find out later you can't drive home, your key's up here. Okay, all votes taken in town meeting will initially be voice votes. If after a voice vote, the moderator or any member so requests, we take an electronic to vote. Make sure your device is turned on. You should see a display with the number of your device on the LED screen. If you see a totally blank screen, press and release the power button on the bottom right corner and it should turn on. The only functional buttons are one, two, and three. One is yes, two is no, three is abstain. 
You never need to press any other button on the device. Other buttons have no effect on your vote. A vote to abstain will be recorded, but it will not count towards the results. You may only vote with the device that has been assigned to you. At the end of the evening, please power off your device by pressing and holding the power button until the LED display is clear, and then return the device to the check-in table where you picked it up at the beginning of the session. Don't take your device home with you, please. We are now going to have a test vote. Whoops. Starting again. Maybe. This is why we do a test vote. Yes. Okay, for now, count 30 seconds to yourself. The timer will be there when we have our first real vote, I've been told. So go ahead and press your vote. And I'm timing it here. We've got 21 seconds left. Ten more seconds. And you can display the vote results. And I think, Mr. Wall, the correct answer is no. Isn't that correct? They just had a six months for the decision, not two years. So you're all way too pessimistic. <laughs> Okay, um, there are no procedural motions that I'm aware of. Tonight's agenda, we'll begin with Article 8, then 9, then 14, then 17, and once we dispose of those four, there will be a motion to dissolve town meeting, assuming we get through all four of those. And so we begin with Article 8, and I call on Mr. Bert Whistle to make the motion. Wait, um, microphone. I move in terms of the article. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. You may speak to your motion. Actually, Mr. Crowner's going to speak. Yes. Rob Crowner for the Planning Board. This is the third consecutive town meeting at which the Planning Board has brought forward articles to clean up Table 3 of the Zoning Bylaw, the dimensional table by pairing the list of footnotes attached to it. When we started, there were 15 footnotes, most of which were rarely used, but whose presence in the dimensional table made it seem more complicated than necessary. If you approve Article 8, only three footnotes will be left. The dimensional table is where the minimum or maximum standards for the basic building dimensions for each of the zoning districts in Amherst is located. These include lot size, lot coverage, frontage, setbacks, and height. Many of the rows, columns, or cells in the table have historically been marked with a footnote that either helps the user interpret the standard or modifies the standard under certain conditions. However, most of the footnotes work just as well elsewhere in regular text of the zoning bylaw, such as in Article 6, where each dimension has a section that explains how to interpret, measure, or apply it. In cleaning up the footnotes, our operating principle has been to delete the ones that serve no purpose and to relocate the ones that are substantive. In each case, preserving how the bylaw works and changing only how it is organized. That holds true for one of the footnotes in this article, footnote K, which allows the planning board as the permitting body for cluster subdivisions to further modify several dimensions that are automatically changed 
when the lot in question is part of a cluster subdivision rather than a standard development. There are four rows at the bottom of table three that establish substitute dimensions in clusters for corresponding rows higher up in the table. And footnote K applies to three of them and nothing else. However, all of the other regulations for cluster subdivisions are located in section 4.3 of the zoning bylaw, including another substitute dimensional table. This one for cluster subdivisions containing affordable units. We propose to move the four table three rows pertaining to clusters into section 4.3, along with footnote K, where they will function exactly the same as they do now, and where you would logically expect to find them anyway. On the other hand, we're, pro we're proposing to simply delete the second footnote in this article, footnote J, even though doing so will have a very small substantive impact. Footnote J changes the standard lot coverage regulation in limited business or BL zones from a maximum of 85% to a maximum of 70% for those BL zones that are not either downtown or on University Drive. However, there's only one such BL zone, and there are only three parcels in that zone. It's at the southern end of Dickinson Street across from Amherst College, and two of the parcels are owned by Amherst College, the former Classic Chevrolet and a surface parking lot. The other is owned by Whiting Oil and is tucked behind the two Amherst College parcels next to the rail line and has no street frontage. You may not even realize it's there unless you look at a map. The two Amherst College parcels are currently non-conforming as to lot coverage, being 80 to 90% covered, where footnote J calls for no more than 70% coverage. Since removing footnote J would change the lot coverage maximum to 85%, one of the parcels would be brought into conformity and the other one would be pretty close. Interestingly, the former Chevrolet dealership covered even more of the lot before Amherst College bought it. When Amherst College came before the planning board for a site plan review hearing, we required them to install a grassy area in front of the building to better define the streetscape, and that has turned out really well. In any case, the planning board believes that footnote J serves no useful purpose, so this article would delete it, leaving only footnotes A, B, and M in table three. This article was unanimously recommended by the planning board. Thank you. And Mr. Slaughter for the select board. Good evening. The select board voted unanimously five to zero to recommend this article to you for the reasons stated by Mr. Crowner. That's it, okay. Um, Finance committee has no position. This will require a two-thirds vote for passage because it is a change to the zoning bylaw. By the way, I was a little remiss before. I didn't mention that the planning director is also sitting at the table in front of me. She's replaced the finance directors for these two articles. Is there discussion on the floor before we come to a vote? I see a hand there, second row from the back. Hi, Lisa Berry, Precinct 2. I just have a question about this. I understand right now that um, this would only ch affect the two lots that you've discussed, but going forward in the future, would it affect all lots to be developed um, to, so that it would effectively minimize the, um, or ma increase the parking lot size and coverage size going forward of all lots and developments? Mr. Crowner? Uh, I'm not sure I understand. It would, it would affect those lots going forward. Um, the parking, the service parking lot is already out of conformity. Um, it would also affect any, if there were any new BL uh, parcels created anywhere in town outside of the downtown or, or on University, University Drive. But um, because the BL zone is, is so uh, contested right now, it's, it's, it's almost inconceivable that any BL lot would be proposed. So there aren't, it doesn't really have any future impact. Further discussion before we come to a vote? Um, yes, I see a hand on the aisle over there. Janet Keller, Precinct 1. Um, I'd like to ask a qu clarifying question. Um, the effective footnote J, therefore, is it reduces the lot coverage, um, and it says there are only three. Um, can you clarify for me what it would do to the BL 
along North Pleasant Street, which is adjacent to the BG. But um, what would happen there, please? Mr. Crowner. So the, uh, the lot coverage maximum there is 85% now. It would stay 85%. Thank you. Further discussion, ready to come to a vote? I see no hands. Again, this requires two thirds for passage. All those in favor of the motion under Article 8, please say aye. aye. Opposed, please say no. The ayes have it by two thirds. We now move on to Article 9, and I call on Mr. Bert Whistle to make a motion. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. You may speak to your motion. And um, yes, this is Mr. Stutzman speaking. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Article 9 relates to how the zoning bylaw regulates parking facilities. In the summer of 2017, the Downtown Parking Working Group made a recommendation to review the permitting requirements for commercial parking facilities. This includes facilities which are privately owned as well as facilities which are the result of a public-private partnership. Currently, such facilities are allowed only by special permit in the general business, village center business, limited business, and commercial districts. The article would change the permitting requirement to site plan review in the general business, village center business, and commercial districts. The limited business district has been omitted from the change because there have been many recent conversations and proposals for these areas which, taken together, warrant a more comprehensive approach. The purpose of the article is to mitigate one of the many barriers to the creation of new parking facilities in the downtown and village centers. Perhaps the most significant of these barriers is cost. As municipalities around the nation and the world have looked to alternative means of funding capital projects, an emerging trend has been the use of public-private partnerships, or P3s. In a local example, the University of Massachusetts this year issued a request for information relating to a potential P3 in Amherst for a variety of uses. The conversation about parking in Amherst, as elsewhere, is a complex one. How much do we need? Where should it go? Who will pay for it? Adopting Article 9 would mean more options are available to the town as it continues this conversation. The planning board voted 5-0, to zero, with four members absent, to recommend the town meeting adopt Article 9. Thank you. Ms. Kruger for the select board. I'm sorry, Mr. Slaughter for the select board. The select board voted unanimously to recommend this to you. Um, I think in short, uh, our rationale was that by providing greater opportunity, we could have uh, some options made available to the community relative to parking in downtown that, that aren't uh, necessarily driven wholly by the town itself. Um, site plan review is a by right uh, allowance, and so th therefore uh, it is allowed but it does allow us to place restrictions on that. And so the process would be such that although people would be allowed to create these types of facilities, there would be restrictions placed on it by uh, the process of site plan review and therefore uh, the community has a lot of opportunity to weigh in and, and help shape that project. Um, and as such, and the opportunity for the, these kinds of projects to move ahead, the select board was uh, in agreement with the planning board in recommending this to you. Thank you. And somebody speaking for the Finance Committee? Oh, there you are, Mr. Jane. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, the Finance Committee supports this article for the reasons stated in the report on page seven. Four voted yes, one no, and two were absent. Thank you very much. Article nine will require a two-thirds vote for passage since it is a zoning bylaw. Um, we are now open to discussion from the floor. Um, yes, right there on the aisle with the red card. Hello, Carol Gray, Precinct 7. I wanted to just explain especially for people who may be new, what the difference is with site plan review versus special permit. 
most special permits go to the Zoning Board of Appeals, which is a three-person quasi-judicial body, and all three people need to agree that the special permit should be granted. Uh, site plan review, when they say it's by right, that what, what that means is you cannot say no. You can impose conditions, but you can't say no. With parking facilities in particular, this is a huge issue. We all see the tall buildings that went up in the downtown, and many of us have regrets about those. Part of why that happened was because the planning department and planning board asked us to waive a parking requirement eight years ago, and we did it. And many of us regret that that happened. We want to be very careful about what we do to our zoning laws because it allows things that may have unintended consequences to happen. I would also add that special permits are obtained in about 97 or 98 percent of cases. And they're obtained usually fairly quickly. Most special permits are granted within two or three months' time or less. They're not arduous. And they're our only protection against the parking garage that is really badly situated. I would urge you to vote no on this. We do not want to lose our opportunity as a town to say no to a development that is horribly out of place in our downtown. Thank you. Um, yes, right in the center there with a the white card. Ruth Hazard, Precinct 3. Um, I have some questions I'd like to clarify. One of them is, um, could you show us a map of the um, uh, zones that are in which this change is being proposed? Would it be possible to have a map? The other is, uh, I wanted to find out under if this change is made, would it be possible to declare any particular parcel within that zone as unsuitable for a parking garage. In other words, would every single parcel within that zone have to be accepted as suitable for a parking garage should a proposal come before the um, appropriate body? And also, what would be the height limit in terms of numbers of floors in each of those zones? Mr. Stutzman. Uh, can I ask IT first for the overhead, and then I'm going to switch back to my presentation? Uh, so I've highlighted here all the zones that I mentioned where the commercial parking facilities are currently allowed by special permit. So that's the BL, the BVC, the COM, and the BG. Um, and then if I could switch to my presentation, please. I guess we'd like to see that one again for a second. Well, if he, if he zooms in, you're going to lose the north and south one. So maybe zoom in on the center. So while that's happening, I just answer one of the other questions that the previous speaker asked, which was about would any parcel within these zones need to be suitable? Would a, a parking facility be allowed there? Well, what we're talking about is these zones where they already are allowed by special permit. So in all these parcels, in all these areas, they would now be allowed by site plan review, as previously discussed. That's not to say that they could actually occur there. There's other regulations of the zoning bylaw that could prohibit such a use from happening, your dimensional intensity regulations. Um, your question about the uh, height is going to vary from district to district. We have four different districts here, and the height allowances will vary uh, in each. So if everyone's OK with the first map, I'm going to switch to an inset on my presentation, which shows the downtown. Uh, so this shows uh, in the red the BG, and the white areas are the BL. And again, the planning board decided not to recommend the change in the BL, because there's been a lot of conversation about these areas and what they should be in the future. Uh, it's important to note that there's two other BL districts that aren't shown here. There's one on University Drive, and there's one that we discussed under the prior zoning article, which is on Dickinson Street. So those are the five BL zones which would not be affected by this change. Thank you. I hear a point of order. Please stand, identify yourself. 
Lisa Rubenstein, Precinct 10. I'd like to see the slide that has the uh, changes because I think there's a mistake on it. Um, okay, I don't know what you mean by the slide that has I mean the, the, the one that delineates where the PSP is going to SPR. It's okay, so the, the No, the one, not either of the, these. You're talking about the article itself? Yeah. Can we get the article on the screen? Okay, um, if you go one, two, four from the left is RG, and under that it says SP to SPR, but in our article that we have, we don't have that. Hang on, let me take a look at the article. No, I see three SPs changing to SPR. All right, but go up under the first one that's SP to SPR, it says RG. The alignment oh, must I be Oh, I see, wrong. yeah. It, it's confusing. So just the display on the screen, there's an alignment. The, the warrant article is correct. Okay, further discussion. Um, yes, Mr. Stutzman. If it would provide some clarity on the last question, if we could see the presentation again, I have a printout in there that should accurately reflect the changes. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes, second row from the back there with the white card. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Adrian Terizzi from Precinct 7. May I request that the presenter point out the three areas on the map, the BG and the BVC and the COM that's going from SP to SPR. I know the map is a little uh, small, but if you could circle in on those areas, I'd appreciate it. Mr. Stutzman. I could have the overhead again, please. So we have, again, these are the districts that are impacted by the change. Uh, in North Amherst, we have the COM here on the BVC. And then we have other COM and BVC areas throughout town. And I'm not at this point going to make a distinction between which are the COM and the BVC because for the purposes of this article, the same change is taking place. If, if someone wants that distinction to be made, I'd be happy to make an attempt to go through here and point out in detail the individual zones. But again, for clarity, the same change is being applied to both those zones. Thank you. Um, yes, back corner with the red card. Oh, Vince O'Connor, Precinct 1. So uh, I have a number of points to make in opposition to this article. First, I think that some of the business village center um, parcels are entirely inappropriate. And those of us who live near them, I think, uh, know that best. Um, and I would urge people on that basis to vote against the, the motion under this article. Excuse me. Excuse me. Um, I hear a point of order, so I'm interrupting you. If you could identify yourself when you get the microphone and stand if you're able to do so. Kay Moran, Precinct 4. Uh, the clock isn't going. Uh, okay, if we can reset the clock and have the speakers start over again. Okay. Okay. I can't see the time on anything, so I don't know where it is. So if we can just reset to three minutes and you can start over again. Okay. So uh, Vince O'Connor, Precinct 1. And um, I'd just like to point out first that uh, with regard to the business village centers, that some of the parcels in the village center business districts are entirely inappropriate for this use um, and certainly inappropriate for it to be done by site plan review. And I would urge uh, the town meeting on, the base, on that basis alone to vote against this article. But th there's a larger issue here. Um, <clears throat> with respect to the public parking garage, you, you see below on your warrant the public parking garage, and it has site plan review for a number of locations. 
Um, and, th and that's really logical because for a public parking garage, there's a five-step process. You have to determine the need. Then if, if a need appears to be sufficient, you have to get a committee together. Um, the committee, then you then have to go through the process of hiring an architect, getting an initial design, getting a final design, and then bringing the final design and cost estimate to the town meeting. That process doesn't exist for a private parking facility. Um, we vote this, and the day after, somebody could bring in a plan, um, having discussed it or not with uh, some of the folks in town hall, but certainly not publicized it. And the next process would be for it to be heard by the, uh, by the planning board. That's just not a good idea um, for a facility of this nature. Um, the, the other, so on that basis as well, we should vote against this article. These are two, and they may end up being physically the same, but the processes are entirely different. One is a very open public process, and the other is a process where the final product appears, um, and that's the first time the public knows about it. Finally, um, with respect to the basis for judgment, there is a 20-issue list for site plan review. Every one of these issues has to be met um, by the facility or it gets turned down. For site plan review, site plan review, you can turn it down, but the issues are minimal, and the planning board, quite frankly, as, as in my recollection, has never turned down a site plan review, even though the bylaw provides for such. And in fact, they, they state in the meetings that you can't turn it down when in fact that's not correct. So on those grounds, we should vote this article down. It is just a, it's comparing apples and oranges. Public and private parking facilities may look the same, but they are not the same, and we should not treat them the same. Thank you. Um. Yeah, white card right there, the third row up. Jerry Weiss, Precinct 8. I have three questions. One, uh, has, has there ever been an application for a commercial parking garage that was not granted uh, by a special permit? Two, um, have there been any conversations with planning board members, with planning department, with other town departments from uh, builders or developers uh, talking about wanting to build a commercial garage. And I guess this would be 2B. Uh, if such conversations have been in the works, could we hear about them? Thank you. Ms. Brestrup. I don't believe we have a commercial parking garage in town. So, um, and I don't remember, I've been in the planning department for about 14 years. I don't remember anyone proposing a commercial parking garage. Um, this article grew out of the work of the Downtown Parking Working Group, which um, suggested that this might be a way to um, provide more parking in the downtown if someone were so inclined if a private entity were so inclined to build either a parking garage or a parking lot um, from which he could make an income. So it was really an idea of the Downtown Parking Working Group that the planning board took up as kind of a courtesy to the Downtown Parking Working Group. And um, there is currently, to my knowledge, no developer who is proposing this type of thing. Um, it's merely opening the door to allow it if it were if it were to be proposed. Thank you. Um, red card way down there. Jim Oldham, Precinct 5. Uh, previous speakers have spoken more eloquently than I can again, to the reasons why uh, this isn't a good idea. I uh, would vote no 
even even if Mr. O'Connor's points ha weren't all so valid and so true, I, I haven't heard a thing from the planning board presenters suggesting why we need a change. I mean, usually when you, you change a, a law, it's because there's a problem. And the, the answer to the previous speaker is nobody's ever been turned down. What evidence do we have that our zoning board of appeals would reject a reasonable uh, request? Why should we doubt that the door isn't already open? What, what evidence do we have that our system needs fixing? I, I've heard absolutely nothing other than one committee thought that maybe uh, this would, would spur development, but, but frankly, we, we have a law, it's on the books, and, and, there's, and this Zoning Board of Appeals has functioned very well for the town in many years, and, and we have no evidence that, that a good, useful uh, parking garage in an appropriate place developed by private developers or in a public-private partnership wouldn't be approved. But, but why loosen up, why, why remove our ability to block it, uh, especially as Mr. O'Connor said, when, when we're talking about such a different type of uh, development process compared to what, what public uh, garages would go through. Mr. Stutzman. Uh, so I think we do have uh, a fair amount of evidence about the atmosphere surrounding uh, the viability of commercial parking in downtown, as Ms. Brestrip pointed out, we don't have any. And um, I think that's an indicator that there are barriers to that being created. We've identified one in this special permit requirement. Another I pointed out previously was the very high cost of creating parking, which leads to another point, which is that as I see it, it's much more likely that we have not an entirely private process, as a previous speaker outlined, being different from the public process for a public parking facility, but more likely we would have a public-private partnership for this type of facility, which would be subject to many, if not all, of the same requirements of the public parking facility that was described earlier with the involvement of the private sector to make the funding possible. Amherst has seen many times over the last few decades, we had a, a case in the 90s where a parking garage was proposed and funding didn't come about. It could happen again, and again, that's a complex conversation about how much parking we need, where does it go, and who pays for it. But this is opening the door so that we have more options as we continue that complicated conversation. Thank you. I see a green card on the aisle there. Claire Bertram, Precinct 8. Um, I'm going to rise in support of this change. I think um, town meeting is savvy enough to understand that um, SP is a, a, a mark on a book that a private developer is going to see and just stay away from. SPR is um, a possibility. Um, and I think this, you know, pu municipal public dollar investment um, is just harder. It's harder in everything. It's harder in all municipal buildings and in parking. So um, sharing that burden with um, private investment uh, seems to me to be a win for this town. But um, so I, I don't see this as being a problem. We can't cite things um, beyond the rules that are in place. So um, all of the rules will stay in place and parking would only go where it would be appropriate. Um, and then, um, you know, I just, I think it's, it's not scary. <laughs> I think it's okay for us to vote yes, and I will vote yes. Thank you. Um, yes, right in the center here. Gordon Freed, Precinct 6. I'm trying to figure out what a commercial parking lot is. Is a commercial because I've been in big cities where there are four higher parking spots that are, tend to be enclosed and you pay when you go in or you pay when you go out. It, I'm speaking purely theoretically. Does this mean that if Big Y wanted to take some of their existing parking, which is grandparented in or legal, um, and start charging for part of it, 
does that become then a commercial parking lot? Or does somebody have to uh, knock down the CVS building in the center of town and create a parking lot or a parking garage there um, in the former footprint of a building? So I'm trying to figure out, is this a, 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 a conversion of an existing legal parking lot or something that is taking a, a space and making it from one kind of use to an entirely different kind of use? I don't know if anyone on the planning board want to hazard an answer, Mr. Stutzman? Sure, so I think in the specific example given with the Big Y parking lot, the things that occur to me might happen in that scenario are that if the use was trying to change how its parking was administered, when the permit was originally issued, there was likely a requirement that a certain number of spaces were dedicated to that use. And so if they were going to then say that they were going to use it in a different way, in the way you, the previous speaker described, and charge for it, perhaps for the general public, that could conceivably be a change of use, and the building commissioner and the relevant uh, permitting authorities would review that change. Thank you. Um, yes, all the way in the back there with the white card. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Helen Berg, Precinct 1. I wonder if there's even a design that's been put forward. Um, I'm wondering if all of these, um, well, the two buildings, Kendrick Place, and the one that's going up where the carrot shops were that are slated apparently to be high cost student housing. Um, is that what is driving this? Um, was that North Amherst Library that I saw in the map as a part of a parking garage? And um, I know the town parking garage is underground. I'd like to see open space and any parking garage is underground. Um, fossil fuels were supposed to run out in 2015. Now we're mining, we're pumping water into the ground, which is, is kind of a crime against humanity. Try and stay on topic, please. Uh, well, that is on topic. Um, I think at some point, um, fossil fuel and individual cars might become a thing of the past. And um, I think we should look forward and make sure that we don't let something in that's going to um, block our view. Um, right there in the center, third row from the back. Um, Janet McGowan, Precinct 8. I was wondering if the planning board could confirm to me my interpretation that um, the zoning bylaw lets the planning board waive all or any of the requirements for site plan submittal review and approval, while it do, there's no similar um, ability to waive all the requirements of a special permit. Mr. Stutzman. Sorry, the section the previous speaker is referring to is in the submission procedures section. It's section 11.222 of the zoning bylaw, and it refers to submission requirements. So the planning board may waive submission requirements like traffic impact studies, landscape plans, etc. And that is what that section refers to. Thank you. Um, third row from the back right near the aisle with the white card there. Uh, Jennifer Tao, Precinct 10. Um, I have a question because I went to a lot of the planning board meetings about. Hold one the e mic close to your oh, mouth. I went to many of the planning board meetings about One East Pleasant, and when we asked why there wasn't any parking, you know, why there wasn't going to be parking as part of that development to accommodate the hundreds of student, you know, residents and their guests, and the planning board said that they. Um, that people were, that students weren't going to be driving, and that the people they didn't anticipate the people that lived in that building would be driving because, as that, um, as that uh, speak, previous speaker said, the planning board um, said that people were not going to be driving cars in the future, and that didn't make sense to a lot of us at the time. So I'm wondering what was this change of heart that you now um, see the need for a parking that. Uh, at, when it really could have been the private developer could have paid for that and it wouldn't even have to be a public-private partnership. But now, 
Uh, anyway, this just seems to be a complete turnaround from where the planning board seemed to be just a few months ago. Yes, from the planning board. Um, I just want to clarify a little that first, uh, well, first One East Pleasant does have some parking in it, right? But, but um, it's her turn. So there is some parking, um, but I want to clarify that it's referring to the downtown parking working group referred this to us, but I I wasn't on the downtown parking working group when this came about, but. Just to clarify that it was through their meetings that the business community and the bid came to them numerous times saying, we understand that the current parking studies are not showing enough of a need for a public garage to be built right now because they are quite costly and you have to show that it can pay for itself and pay for the money that you put into it. But they do feel, I think, to sort of counter on someone else's statement that the door is not open right now for the ability for a private developer if they were building something and felt, and that could be more than just housing, it could be you know, a supermarket or something, that they felt that they had enough demand that they could rationalize the cost for adding a parking um, to it. Not necessarily a, a huge garage or anything, but that they could add some parking if they felt it was tight and it would help the businesses that they were cr trying to create. So I just wanted to clarify, it, it would be great if there was some business community here to back this up. But So it sort of came from them and it went to the downtown parking working group and then it came to us. And when we evaluated it, we didn't see any harm and that it might open some opportunities than the way that the zoning currently is very limiting. Thank you. Might be ready to come to a vote soon. Um, yes, I see great second in from the aisle with the white card there. Chris Riddle, Precinct 2. I would love to hear from somebody from the Downtown Planning Working Group. Might there be someone from that group here? I don't see any hands so I guess not are we do we want further discussion we're we ready to come to a vote um, I see a green card way over on the aisle there hi Nina Mankin precinct one I just want to thank the working committee for having put a lot of thought into how to try to open up some more parking in town if this is something that is actually going to allow us to have more parking without doing any actual immediate harm, but just open up the possibility for developers to come in with some private money, then I don't see any harm in doing that. And I think we very, very much need more parking in our downtown. Thank you. Um, second row with the white card there. And if, if you can stand when you're recognized, if you're able to do so, it's helpful to everybody. Hi, Lisa Kosanovich, Precinct 7. I just want to understand the public and the private part, obviously, the developer. Hold the microphone really close. Sorry. Um, I want to understand what the public commitment part of it is before I vote. Um, so in other words, the developer is paying for the, I just want to understand what the town's commitment is financially. Um, Mr. Stutzman. So again, there's no particular project in mind for this, let alone a budget, a, a partner, any of this. This is just allowing the possibility that there may be, and these public-private partnerships, again, are a, a growing trend around the country and the world, and they take a myriad number of forms. And so um, to try to go into how one might be structured might be beyond the scope of this meeting, but the most important thing is that it would be easier to enter into one of these agreements if this article passes. Thank you. Um, white card in the very back there. Michael Burkhardt, Precinct 6. I call the previous question. Motion of the previous question has been made and seconded. If two-thirds of you vote to do so, we will immediately end debate and vote on the motion under Article 9. First vote is the motion to end debate. All those in favor of the motion for the previous question, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, please say no. No. Moderator hears two-thirds. We now come to an immediate vote on Article 9, which in itself requires two-thirds for passage. All those in favor of the motion under Article 9, please say aye. Aye. 
Opposed, please say no. No. Moderator does not hear two thirds. Um, I see a request for an electronic vote, so we will have an electronic vote. Issues with the devices. Yes, 58, no, 104. We did not achieve two thirds, so Article 9 has failed. 58, 104. We now move on to Article 14. And I call on Pat Holland to make the motion. Oh, hang on. Before you make the motion, I'm sorry, we're going to switch seats. Finance Committee is going to come to the front table. Yes, she's going to be reading a motion, and it's different and longer. Well, it concludes much more of the article. I now recognize Ms. Holland to make a motion under Article 14. The motion is on the screen, and she will be reading the text that's on the screen. This motion is slightly different from the one that was uh, mailed out to you Actually, with your packet. That's why, yeah. why I'm don't you, reading I'm sorry. It. Read the motion first, then talk about it. Okay. Thanks. I move that the town appropri appropriate the sum of $50,000 in the undesignated fund balance from, sorry, I got that wrong. Um, I'm gonna start over if you don't mind. I move that the town appropriate the sum of $50,000 from free cash in the undesignated fund balance to fund the design by an architect of a plan in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law Chapter 7 C, to include but not be limited to making the following significant improvements to the North Amherst Library within the following constraints. A, make all three floors of the building fully accessible by elevator with as little impact on the building's Excuse historic- Excuse me, I'm gonna interrupt you. I hear a point of order. Please rise and wait for a microphone. Amy Middleman, Precinct 5, the clock isn't changing. No, that's because she's making a motion. She's not speaking to the motion yet. I'm sorry, Ms. Holland, you may continue. Okay. <clears throat> um, A, make all three floors of the building fully accessible by elevator with as little impact on the building's historic components as possible while minimizing damage to the two large maples at the rear of the building and maintaining the building's character and its architectural and aesthetic unity. B, provide 
fully accessible bathroom and water fountain for use by the public and library staff. C, develop and install a more climate, energy, and space conscious method of heating and cooling of the building. D, at least double the North Amherst library space available to the public in the existing building. E, add a sidewalk at the south edge of the paved area at the rear of the library building that would connect to a new accessible ground floor entry at the rear of the North Amherst Library building. F, finish and furnish the unfinished attic space for use for public meetings, for ESL conversation circles, for public readings, including readings for children, etc. G, do not assume any change in the present out, um, layout of Sunderland Road. And additionally, authorize the application for an acceptance of any gifts, requests, or grants for this, these purposes. I hear a second. You now have five minutes to speak to your motion. As the motion says, Article 14 is asking for $50,000 from the town for an architect's design for improvements to the North Amherst Library. This article is brought by the friends of the North Amherst Library. The problem with this library is that the seven steps up to its only door are not accessible by wheelchair. These stairs also make it difficult for those using walkers or canes or lifting strollers. The staff there are very kind about carrying out books to people who can't get up the stairs, but those people wanting to browse the collection can't do it. This library has been owned by the town since it was built in 1893, not by the Jones Library, which did not exist at that time. Here's a picture of the deed. Thank Bonnie McCracken for locating this deed. Uh, I'll just show you this first page, and I don't expect that you can read it that well. But let me know if you want to, want to read more. Just a little bit of history. I love history. The North Amherst Library Association, Association decided to build this library after the nearby school got so crowded that the library had to leave. The cost of construction was $2,500. The 1893 town meeting voted to give $500 toward the cost. The rest of the money came from North Amherst residents, some of whom were wealthy farmers, lumbermen, and mill owners. The architect was paid $25. Today, the Jones Library staffs and manages the North Amherst Library and has in the past used donated and appropriated funds to make improvements to the building. But it is the town that is responsible for making this library accessible. The Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 also requires a wheelchair accessible bathroom and water fountain. Right now, the bathroom in the library is down the steep, narrow basement stairway and is not open to the users of the library. This summer, a local retired school teacher, Terry Johnson, donated a rented porta potty to the library for three months to, having a, to help with the children's summer reading program. Obviously, having a bathroom would have been better. As it is now, People, including children, have to cross busy Montague Road to use the bathrooms at the local stores over there. The only way to have access for the disabled will be by an elevator. The building has three floors and a wheelchair accessible elevator on the back of the building would provide access to all three floors. The basement is of full height with windows and houses books along with a huge oil tank. Article 14 asks for a more energy conscious method 
of heating and cooling the building. Eliminating that huge oil tank will free up a lot of space. The attic has a pitch ceiling with full height in the center of the room and would be a good spot for community meetings. Could we turn, return to the previous slide, please? The $50,000 would come from free cash, which currently has $3.8 million in it. Once the architect's design is done, the work can be funded in part through the Local Community Preservation Act budget, which supports making historic buildings acceptable, accessible. I mean. And I'm sure that North Amherst residents will come through with financial support support as they did for the original building. I'll stay here for, to answer questions. Thank you. I now call on Mr. Wald for the select board. Could you have a step back from the podium and have a seat though, thanks. Mr. Wald for the select board. Thank you. I move to refer this article to the select board and the Jones Library trustees. You may speak to your motion. Thank you. Uh, we, I shouldn't have to say it's obvious. We share with the petitioners uh, a, an admiration for this library, a love of the building and its functions, and a desire to make it more available to more people more of the time, just not this way, and I'll explain why. It's a beloved institution. It serves important purposes for North Amherst residents. I know it was transformative in the life of our own daughter, so there's no question about that. Uh, the needs cited are very real but both the needs and the means of satisfying them are rather more complex than the present motion allows. You're gonna hear us speak about process. You'll probably hear others say, why are they focusing on process? We don't need process. Uh, we think we do and we're gonna tell you why. Uh, if you let me explain. We're not about process here for the sake of process. We're talking about process because we work in town government. We see the entire array of services and expenditures we see how things get done here, and we think that there are reasons not to act precipitately in this case, uh, and instead to follow our normal paths. Uh, process is not an end in itself. Process exists for very specific reasons. Transparency, rationality, predictability, and fairness. Uh, there have been questions about fairness, for example, in the current funding of capital projects. Uh, as you know, there's a, a long list of things we're trying to get done very expensive projects, and for years people would say, what about the fire station? Then along came important opportunities to get state funding for the library and for the schools. Uh, we're not acting on those right now, but be that as it may, uh, people f were wondering why those got to jump ahead of the line, so to speak, and there were good reasons, because funding was available. Sometimes that happens, but the more that we erode that sense of predictability, especially in a tough budget year with major capital projects online, the more complicated things become. They are also questions of substance that arise from the process here. Uh, for example, this well-intentioned article focuses ad hoc on a single issue, really, uh, the one of accessibility writ large. Uh, we would submit to you, you cannot really examine that in the absence of other questions. One obvious one mentioned was the whole configuration of the intersection. That's a major issue. The town bought the adjoining, adjoining property in order to regulate the traffic flow, but also to redesign the civic core there, which we saw in the North Amherst pro uh, planning process, to make the library a more functional space, probably with a larger expansion. Who, do, who knows what we have in mind for the library? That's part of the problem. This is just one part of a bigger picture. Uh, there's also the question of the existing building as such. The article refers to unused or poorly used spaces, the basement and the attic or second floor, as you will. Uh, this is fine, but to us it does not make sense to tackle the question of access to the building without tackling the question of program. In other words, how is the building going to be used? For what purposes? What functions? How does it fit with the library's core mission and delivery of services? That's something only the library can determine, the library staff, the library trustees. They should be part of this process at the beginning or it should come from them in a sense, it should follow. We think this is putting the cart before the horse. As you heard, it's also a historic structure, it is indeed. It's what we call a contributing structure in the North Amherst, North, North Amherst National Historic Register District. So it's a very important building, it's iconic. And we'd be very reluctant to make major changes to the building envelope despite the, the sincere 
promised to be as judicious as possible, again, without taking into account the larger configuration of the intersection, the roadway, the civic core, and the uses of that building. What's going to happen when you get inside that door, that elevator, and so forth? There's also the question of expense. You heard a long list of noble things that are being proposed here, from elevators to sidewalks. People we've talked to have said that's easily a million dollar job, if nothing else. There's no money for that right now. In other words, if and when we do decide to make these well-intentioned and probably needed changes, the issue's gonna come to you and to town meeting. But before that, it's gotta go through the Joint Capital Planning Committee, through that process. So it seems to us but logical that a request for the study and its funding should also begin there with the Joint Capital Planning progress, uh, process. And in conclusion, let me just say one word about that process. I know that we have a very open system of government here, both thanks to the open meeting law and the way we do business, and that we have these public meetings. You can go to these meetings, you can read about them, you can see some of these on TV, and yet we realize in the select board, we realize that people in the public often feel left out, either confused or objectively excluded for a variety of reasons. And to be fair, the joint capital planning process is perhaps the most vexing of these because unlike other ones in which there's a citizen commission, uh, this one dr is driven largely by department heads. They come to the town with budget requests uh, through the joint capital planning process. And we realize that's hard for you to, to deal with and we'd like to try to remedy that too. So part of our proposal, as in the case of social service spending, which we took up earlier this year based on town meeting actions last spring, uh, would be to examine not just the proposal itself, but the way that we can make the joint capital pro planning process more transparent, more accessible to citizens. So again, while supporting the intentions behind this, we think we're all better served by the referral for the aforementioned reasons. Thank you. Thank you. So the motion before us now is a motion to refer to the select board and the Jones Library trustees. Um, that will require a majority vote for passage. If that fails, we'd then be back to the main motion, which also requires a majority vote. I'm gonna allow discussion to include both the pros and cons of referral and the pros and cons of the main motion. It would be too difficult to kind of split them out. Um, next, I wanna hear from the finance committee. I believe someone wants to speak, but I'm not sure. Yes, Mr. Sharma. Um, the finance committee voted do not recommend this article by a vote of six to zero and one abstaining. Thank you. Um, as I said, point of order over there, microphone is on its way. Hi, I'm Peter Everett, Precinct 2. I just wanted to clarify, we have a motion on the floor for referring the article back to the board, but the recommendation there from the finance board was in right. against the article, not this motion. Yes, so the finance committee again, Ms. Talman did not vote uh, the article or the I'm sorry the motion to refer did not come to the Finance Committee we were strictly uh, voting on the article itself thank you no no position on referral and as I said the motion to refer will require majority for passage as will the main motion if we get back to it and we are now open to discussion from the floor Um, yeah, so white card right there, fourth row from the front. Okay. And keep in mind, a red card would mean you are opposed to the motion to refer. A green card means you are in favor of the motion to refer. You may Mary proceed. Mary Sayre, Precinct 3. Um, and I live in North Amherst. Um, I can see there's some problems with Article 14. Um, but as a resident of North Amherst and having grown up in Amherst, and lived in North Amherst for 25 years, uh, my concern is that absolutely nothing will happen for the North Amherst Library. Um, because a few years ago, in fact, there was uh, talk about, from the Jones Library, about shutting the branch libraries altogether. And my feeling was that because our branch got some money from a private donor, and that was put into the library, we saved the library. I'm just concerned that this will go back down to the bottom of the list. And uh, for me, it's very important that something does get done with the North Amherst Library. So I don't, 
I don't know how I'm going to vote, but I do feel that I'd like some assurance from the town that this will actually be of concern to the town because it doesn't seem in the past that our library has been. People say they like it, but um, it's really been through our neighborhood concern that anything has been done. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Wald. That's a very good question the previous speaker raised. I think that's just very briefly, that's why we thought referral was a more positive step. Rather than voting it down because we have some concerns about its practicality, we want to make sure it stays on the radar screen and we want our hands in that process as well so we can keep an eye on things, communicate, and negotiate with the library and, and keep the public informed. Thank you. Um, do you have fourth row from the front? Green card there. I'm in favor of the, mo oh, um, K. Moran, Precinct 4. I'm in favor of the motion to refer. The uh, capital planning process in this town um, was developed in the 1990s because until then there was a lot of um, fighting back and forth for individual pro projects uh, between the library trustees. They had their own projects. The schools did and the town did. And this was a way of getting everybody together to look at the needs of the entire town. And that's the process that's been followed ever since. Uh, the Joint Capital Planning Committee has eight people on it, two from the Finance Committee, which is appointed by the moderator, and the other six are from the Select Board, the School Committee, and the Library Trustees, who are all directly elected by the voters of the town. They get together and spend many meetings looking at all the proposed projects from um, all the departments. And this, would, this kind of project would um, most normally come from the library trustees. Uh, it doesn't come from them. Um, so it would be a good idea to refer it back to them and see where they see this project in um, the priorities that they have for needs of the whole library system. This is a, doing this article, doing projects like this one at a time, bringing them to town meeting, um, it's as if a neighborhood in South Amherst wants their sidewalks built. They haven't been built, they're needed, people walking in the streets, so they bypass this whole capital planning process, bring an article to town meeting to get a couple million dollars for sidewalks. If we do that throughout the whole town, we're going to go back to where we were in the 80s and 90s with just chaos and no way of setting priorities. Thank you. Um, white card way over there in the corner. Laura Quilter, Laura Quilter Precinct 9. Um, when I was on the Jones Library tours last spring, um, I asked specifically about the North Amherst Libraries because I had been told, you know, I'd seen it raised in town meeting that there were no publicly accessible bathrooms, et cetera, and I was told by the Jones Library staff at that point that um, the, the North Amherst branch was with the responsibility of, of the town and not of the Jones Library, and so I guess my question is, have there been any motions brought forth by the town, by the JCPC, or by the Jones to deal with the North Amherst Library? Because I've been hearing this issue of public bathrooms raised several times, and if nobody is addressing this, then it had seemed to me to be an appropriate way to kind of get some initial planning money. This is not the $2 million to actually do the project, but just to like see what would be involved. That seems like a fact-finding thing. So I'm just curious, has there ever been a proposal brought forth from Jones or JCPC or any of the other groups to deal with this issue. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Bachman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I think a significant thing that town meeting did last spring was to purchase that important parcel of land immediately behind the Jones Library. With that parcel of land, new opportunities are now available to look at this um, parcel and to make and look at an addition on the back that would allow, that would accommodate a, an elevator and maybe additional space 
to in a parking area that would accommodate the um, Jones Library. So that was one of the goals in purchasing that piece of land to uh, given us additional opportunities and to look at the civic core as a, as a whole. So it hasn't come because there was a sense that there wasn't room uh, because there was a neighboring property immediately uh, on the back side of the library. But now that we own that parcel to the wisdom of town meeting, uh, this is something that we can look at again. And that's, I think that's why it wasn't brought up earlier. Thank you. Um, wait for a microphone. Microphone up in the front here, please. Um, stand up, please. In general, if you're able to stand up when you're recognized, please do so, because then the microphone people can find you. Yes. Uh, Carrie, Pre Carrie Spitzer, Precinct 1. I just wanted to clarify, you've said the Jones Library. I believe you were talking about the North Amherst Library. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, yes, one, two, three, four, fifth row back with the red card. Yes, you. Uh, Michael Greenabout, Precinct 6. Um, I would much rather have had this. Oh, I, I oppose the motion to refer and I support the main article. I would much rather have had it come from the uh, library trustees. I was starting to wish that in 1970 when I became principal of Marks Meadow School. And when that beautiful building started to serve Marks Meadow children, and when Marks Meadow took on the responsibility for the North Amherst School to deal with population overflow uh, in 1972, that library was their school library. Um, I love that library. I haven't been in it for quite a few years, but I drive by it all the time and it makes my heart warm. Um, the library trustees should have brought this to us long before this. Mr. Walls, this is pre precipitous. It is not precipitous at all. This has been going on for four, gen four decades, to my knowledge. And I applaud the Friends of the North Amherst Library, and I suggest to the select board and the trustees that if we pass this article, they can easily and in a friendly way become involved with the process to address some of the concerns that Mr. Wald has mentioned. But while the, I certainly support the capital planning project, the joint capital planning project, this has been going on for so long in North Amherst with so little interest on the part of the town in general that I'm very happy to support this article. Thank you. Um, red card, one, two, three, fourth row back there. Yes. Uh, Molly Turner, Precinct 1. Uh, I want to speak against referring and I'm in favor of the article. This, I, I want to talk about process because this, Mr. Wall brought it up. Uh, it's, it, this is a process. We're, we're exercising the process right now. We are bringing a petition article. This is something that we as a town, as citizens of the town, we have a right to do. Uh, there is a, a process which is explained in uh, various places. The League of Winter Women's Voters Handbook says, a petition article is an article brought to town meeting for discussion and possible action by a citizen rather than by a board or committee of the town. Any person or group can bring a petition article on any topic that is relevant to action by town meeting government. Uh, the JCPC, th this is written into our uh, uh, charter. This is a definite right that we have. The JCPC was, uh, is an administrative committee which was created in the 90s and it's mostly administrative. It's, mo I sat on that committee for six years. And um, the JCPC is, an ins is inside baseball. It's, uh, where they it's driven by the departments, and it's a question about how to spend the big bucks. Uh, who gets it? You know, it's a, a fairer process, but it's strictly uh, department driven, not citizen driven. So, um, unfortunately, at the JCPC, the process is 
there is a process where articles can go to die. They just get pushed further and further out. Uh, five more years, five more years, or what have you. And to my knowledge, the library has never brought anything to the JCPC in regard to the North Amherst Library. So I vote against, uh, I urge you to vote against the referral and to vote yes on the article. Thank you. Um, green card in the center, second to back row. Lewis Mainz, uh, Precinct 10. Uh, Alex would have been better suited to saying this than I am. I'm not a member of the trustees. I am a member of the Friends of the Jones Library System. And I was present at a meeting last week of the library trustees. And they outlined the responsibilities, the focus for the director for the coming year. And that included focus now that we've got the Jones Library itself launched on its process. The coming responsibility that was emphasized was the branch libraries. And it is not a forgotten or lost or denied responsibility. I see with the trustees behind it and the director sympathetic that there will be motion, whatever you do, uh, by the Jones Library system toward this. Thank you much. Thank you. Um, yes, the red card back in the corner there. Hi, um, Marla Jamit, Precinct 7. Um, so my family uh, very much enjoys visiting the uh, North Amherst Library, um, but our visits are quite necessarily short, uh, given that there are no restrooms there, uh, nor is there any water, um, which is, is really quite uh, trying for young children. And I, I guess I, I, I will support this article because I think this is really a pressing issue. Uh, essentially, uh, we are operating a public building which cannot really fully serve the public and um, probably causes significant discomfort for some members of the public. And, um, and that also by continuing to do this, that we make ourselves vulnerable to lawsuit um, because of uh, the ADA and because of state laws um, requiring buildings to be properly equipped. And so I, I think this is fairly urgent. If, if the library is going to stay open, that we look into um, making the necessary repairs. And, um, and that the process of um, beginning to assess this building could begin now with this $50,000 um, expenditure. Uh, we would just be voting on this sum, not on allocating uh, the sum for renovation. I, I think we should give this a chance and, and see where it goes. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, right down here in the corner. Thank you. Chris Hoffman, Precinct 7, library trustee, although I'm only speaking for myself, not for the board at the moment. Um, a few things I wanted to bring up. First of all, and just so I don't run out of time, let me bring up the most important one. One thing, if you're thinking this is just a symbolic or such motion, pay attention to the fact that this does not say, look at these things, including this. This says, do these things. So you're voting for $50,000 specifically, not just to make it a better place, put in a water fountain, et cetera but specifically to make all three floors accessible, make the meeting rooms on the top floor. And uh, so I am enthusiastically asking you to refer it back to the trustees so we can look at, meet with people, talk with people, and decide what makes sense in that building to keep its historical nature. And then come back and say, hey, if you want to give us $50,000 to do a study, because we need to, obviously, bathrooms. Nobody's going to die bathrooms. But given realistically what's there, that's great. But remember, you are actually voting for all those items, including a design that does not take into account that what we know is going to happen, we don't know exactly what, with the intersection. The other couple of things I just wanted to mention, somebody mentioned the library director, and that is true. One of the three goals for the director this year 
is to develop plans for the branches, and particularly the North Amherst Library. Her evaluation, one third of her evaluation, is going to be based on that. This is not going to be a forgotten issue from the trustees or the director or the staff, believe me. And just as a brief thing to, um, since people had talked about possibly some of the things they're saying might have led people to think that we don't have a commitment to the branches, the North Amherst Library in particular. Um, we have always been strongly supportive of the branches. I can't tell you how many people in town, and a few people, luckily only a few, but a few people in town government who said, why don't you just close the branches to save money? And we've never done that. We've never done that. We've never even considered doing it. It's been tough. It's been, we've had to stretch our budget, but we've never considered it. We consider them, they are important. They are, get a surprising, a surprising amount of traffic. They are an important part of the communities. So I'm asking you to refer this so that we can look at it, we can make a plan, we can have meetings with the organizers and other people in the town of Amherst, North Amherst, regular parts of Amherst, who weren't involved in this article, see what they want. We can look and see what sort of grants and funding might be coming up. The JCPC can look at what sort of money might be available. And we can put together a plan. We're not gonna, this is not gonna be thrown under the rug. We can put together a real plan for things we can realistically do to this building in the next few years. Thank you. Um, Yes, in the one, two, three, four, five, um, Mr. Riddle with the red card. There was no easy way. Um, you didn't use my name, I know. I, I was a, uh, my name is Chris Riddle, I'm Precinct 2. Um, I'm a retired architect. Um, I would, what I want to vote for is uh, the, re the referral and the study uh, by the architect. I think that having a, uh, for spending $50,000 to sort out how this building would be made accessible, how the upper floors would be used in a, I would suggest in my terminology, a design development sort of level, not construction documents, not bid documents, uh, the, the uh, 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 plans and elevations and perspective views of what it would take to make this building accessible, I think that would inform very much the work of the select board and the library trustees in working and uh, de demonstrating the feasibility or lack thereof of uh, making this building accessible and making the additional spaces available. So what I want to do is vote for yes, yes for the motion to refer and yes for the motion to do the architectural study. I can't do that, okay. so uh, I'm going to vote uh, no for the motion to refer. Thank you. Um, yes, Mr. Neal. I like your card. Hello, uh, Tim Neal, Precinct 4. I'm, I am not speaking for the Finance Committee right now. These are my own personal thoughts. Um, I, will, I am in support of referral, and let me talk about the finances on that. Uh, one of the problems that a previous speaker said was we might have willing, not necessarily willing, Italy, but we have a variety of pro projects that might come up before this body for debate outside of the process, and that's a real concern. Uh, in this case, had this petitioner petitioned through the normal process, perhaps the funds could be have been gathered from the CPA funds and not come from uh, the free cash because uh, of the historic nature of the building. In other words, the debate really hasn't gone through the normal process, and I just don't see the, the urgency for that, uh, and we can certainly have uh, this petitioner as any other petitioner go through our processes, have the proper people talk about it, and maybe bring it up at the Springtown meeting, perhaps with different funding, perhaps with a different plan, et cetera. So I am going to strongly support that we refer it back to the select board and the trustees to have those discussions. Thank you. Um. Um, yes, right here, fourth row with the white card. Abby Jensen, Precinct 4, I call the question. Motion of the previous question has been made and seconded. If two-thirds of you vote yes, then we will come to an immediate vote on the motion to refer. This is the motion for the previous question. Two-thirds vote to end debate. All those in favor of the motion for the previous question, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, please say no. 
Uh, moderators in doubt, we're going to have an electronic vote on this one. Yes, 94, no, 66. We did not achieve a two-thirds vote, so we will continue discussion. And I see a green card on the aisle right there, please. It's okay. It's okay. Change of glasses. Um, Alex Lefebvre, Precinct 10. Uh, I am also a Jones Library trustee, and I serve on the Buildings and Facilities Committee. Um, the board, um, I am in favor of the referral. We did not vote on that as a board. That's not something we discussed. We did, however, vote unanimously 6-0 um, not to endorse the article, and I'll explain why in a minute. But I think first and foremost, what needs to be addressed is the fact that the North Amherst Library has had issues relative to accessibility and lack of a public bathroom for far, far too long. And I think that people are genuinely frustrated by how long that process has taken, and I understand that. And quite frankly, I appreciate this petition and I appreciate the people behind the petition because they have kept the North Amherst Library and the South Amherst Library at the top of the needs. And when I joined the trustees less than a year ago, I heard about the North Amherst Library. I used to live in the South Amherst area, so Munchen was my library, not the North. And it was their voice that brought it to our attention. And I can tell you that it has been a topic of conversation with the trustees, at least since I have been on the board. So to that end, as people have already spoken to, the uh, goals for the library director, she has three for her contract. And one of those is addressing the needs of the branch libraries. Also, the action plan for the library for FY19 we identified gaps in services that have been identified as well as the immediate priorities for the library. Also under those sections of our fiscal year 19 plan are the needs of the branch libraries. Um, to that end, the director and staff of uh, the North Amherst Library will be developing at the behest of the Building and Facilities Committee, which has already met and discussed this, with community feedback, a building program this year for the North Amherst Library. A building program, as many of you may be talk, heard me talk about last town meeting, uh, is, uh, identifies the services the branch will offer, such as community meeting spaces, adult fiction, ESL rooms, children's, etc., and the space needs associated with each service. The library's fiscal year 19 budget includes a placeholder for the architect fees for design work once the building program is complete. We don't know the full scope of the work to be done yet, so there's a placeholder rather than a dollar figure. While the trustees appreciate the estimate of $50,000 in this article for those design fees and the efforts to request the funds from town meeting, the request is premature. The particular concern that we have with Article 14 is that it specifies the design of a plan under the constraints listed in paragraphs A through G. We don't necessarily take issue with any of the items in paragraph A through G, but without completing the building program, we're prematurely setting the design priorities for the building. For example, the warrant calls for doubling the public square footage from 800 to 1,600 square feet within the existing building, placing the entrance at the rear of the building on the ground floor, and creating a community room on the third floor. These may all potentially be great ideas for a building program, but we don't know yet if it makes more sense to put the community room on the first floor where the entrance is going to be, Finish up, please. Okay. Um, or if it's better to leave it on the third floor, um, we just we don't know yet how best to put all of the services in the building. What we also don't know is if we finish all three floors, will we need additional staffing? Is that fiscally responsible? Can we do it? Can we not do it? I'm sorry, you need to finish okay, up. Okay, I'll finish. We're thrilled that the petitioners are requesting funds for the design process, and we would hope that they would do so again for fiscal year 19 after a building program has been created. 
This particular warrant, however, is premature because it constrains designs to a plan that did not involve the library staff, library director, or the full community that relies on the branch. Thanks, sorry for going over. Um, on the aisle there, are you waiting to speak or are you just standing around? Yes. Okay. okay, are you a registered voter in Amherst? But not a town meeting member. Sarah McKee, Precinct 6. Okay, um, microphone, wait for the microphone, please. Sarah McKee, Precinct 6. I would just like to address the point made about there might be Community Preservation Act funds available for an architect's design. Once there is a design, yes, for the building, but for the design, I mean, for the building, whatever's done. For the design, however, no. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right in the front corner here. Uh, Mr. Moderator, uh, I think I'm sorry, four, identify yourself, please. Alan Root, Precinct 5. I think after 40 years of waiting for somebody to do something about our original public library for the town, which was, is the North Amherst Library, it makes sense to take it out of a lot of people's hands who say wonderful things, but for the 34 years I've lived in this town, I've been waiting for something to happen up there at the North Amherst Library. I find it exceedingly depressing to find that after all of the years that I've been in this town, and to find out that beyond my years, there are many people is who are talking about 40 years, that this issue has been talked about, talked about, talked about. I think we need to take it out of the hands of the trustees of the library. I think the, I, I find some objections with the way a member of the select board is trying to gain some business from uh, uh, us, or the town meeting. I'd like to see a few things come out of town meeting that don't run through the various boards here. I criticize the, the way in which uh, we're left out in the cold. Somehow, if something comes out of town meeting, <laughs> it's captured very often by existing boards and so forth that want to take over. We have something here that if anybody has an objection to the situation and to the, the ideas that are forward, concrete, and could be added to, I suspect, by the uh, people who come to do the job, my feeling is that everybody can come away from this happy rather than conflicted. So I would hope that we would defeat the substitute motion and that we would pass the original motion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, fourth row in with the white card there. Uh, Marcy Sklove, Precinct 2. I'm trying to understand the legal language of the paragraph before um, A through G. So if the architect sees the building and says, oh, wouldn't it be great to have a, an addition put on? Is it limited that, it, that there cannot be additional plans um, that are outside of these, of these listed A through G? And if it looks like it would be awful to um, do the third floor as a community room, so are they committed to doing the third floor because it's listed this way? I'm just trying to understand how limiting this, um, this is. Thanks. Mr. Bachelman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, when, if we were to go out to bid for a, uh, architectural services for this, we would list items A through G as the tasks that the architect would be required to meet. 
So the architect would be said, this is your plan, this is the schedule you need to meet, and this is what you need to design, design for, and that's how it would work. Thank you. Um, see a white card, third row from the back there. Lisa Berry, Precinct 2, move to call the question. Most of the previous question has been made and seconded. If two-thirds of you vote yes, we will come to an immediate vote on the motion to refer. All those in favor of the motion of the previous question, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, please say no. No. Moderator, here's two-thirds. We now come to a vote on the motion to refer Article 14 to the Select Board and the Jones Library trustees. This requires a majority for passage. All those in favor of the motion to refer, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, please say no. No. Moderator is in doubt. We'll have an electronic vote. We have 79 yes and 92 no, so the motion to refer has failed. The main motion is on the floor, and this also requires a majority vote. Are we ready to come to a vote? Um, I still see some hands, so I'm going to call on hands until we're ready. So right way down in the side there. Hi, I'm Nina Mankin, Precinct 1, and I went to Mark's Meadow and had Principal Greenabaum as my principal. And, um, and I spent a lot of time in the North Amherst Library, and I live in North Amherst, and I, now I bring my child to the North Amherst Library. And it's been a long, long, long time that we haven't had a bathroom, and a long time that we as, as neighborhood people haven't seen any movement. And recently we've seen some really impressive movement. The town has put up $650,000, am I correct, to buy the parcel of land around the library to be able to do the work that needs to be done on the North Amherst Library. Um, this will allow a planning process to go through that is not limited by provisions that have not been worked through with the staff and the people who usually make decisions about these kinds of building changes. I hope that I get to participate in that conversation about what's needed there for myself and my child. And um, I feel as though we've had 40 years of waiting, and that's been many different groups of trustees of the library over those 40 years. It's not like it's the same people who are making those decisions now who, who uh, have been holding us back for all these years. We actually seem to have a group of people at the library who want to move forward with this. And I encourage everyone, uh, and I, I'm also really appreciative of this because it does outline the problems and it does tell us that this is where our attention needs to be. And it's people who love this little library the way that we all do. And I encourage us to vote this down and to come back and make sure that this money is there in the spring for the right project. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see somebody, I'm, I'm not calling on you. If you want to be called on, if you're a town meeting member, you really need to be down here. If you're not a town meeting member, you should be at the front of the aisle. But I'm not going to call on people who are way back there, OK? You know, if you need to stand for any reason and can't sit, talk to me about it and let me know. Um, yes, look, Ms. Brewer. I actually have a question. And that is in regards to process. I know we said we don't do process for the sake of process. But how? If I could ask the town manager or finance staff, how will we manage a financial expenditure like this outside of the JCPC process? Because that's where it would normally be. So where do we put this to keep track of it? Mr. Balkerman? Uh Thank you, Mr. Chair. So typically, first you have to understand the JCPC process. Typically what happens in a JCPC process, which 
Ms. Moran explained, uh, representatives from the school committee, finance committee, uh, board of library trustees, and select board um, get together. Any proposal that's presented to JCPC has a very detailed sheet that goes with it. it includes the project cost or estimated project costs. How did that estimated project cost get, es get established? Is it per foot? Did you get have an, a bid done? Did it estimator? Um, how do you characterize the project? Is it health and safety? How it, that helps set the priority? Um, how does the, this department rank the project uh, in terms of all the other projects? What is the time frame for starting and finishing the design, the permitting, the procurement, the acquisition, the construction, the training, and the deployment? And then there's a detailed cost for each one of those steps that's required to be presented to JCPC. The financing sources, if any, are, are asked for. And then the impact on the operating budget, which is very crucial, uh, is asked for. Does this, is, going to, is this going to require additional staff? Are there is there debt service that's included with it? Are there um, maintenance costs, insurance costs, energy costs that are gonna be included in this? So all that information is gathered together and presented to the JCPC. In this case, this is outside the JCPC process. So what would be expected is that we have in the article, it's very explicit about what the program of action would be. It's not coming from the Board of Library Trustees, it's coming from um, the petitioners. And so we would put that and we put that out to bid for an architect to do these things. The architect would come back and we put the parameters on the, on the project. You know, we have half a percent for art that's been approved. Um, if it applies to this, the same for the zero energy buildings, if it, if it applies to this as well, if that gets approved by the Attorney General. Um, so we would look at all those things and, and put that into this project. And then we'd look for an architect who can meet all those needs. The architect would then would just move forward with it. And then the request for funds would then come back into the JCPC pro process. Thank you. Um, yes, um, the white card in the corner there. Lawrence Quigley, uh, Precinct One. Uh, clearly there are, are more efficient ways to do things, but uh, I, I feel uh, uncomfortable accepting the uh, notion that this is not the proper channel, sir. Uh, this is a proper channel. Uh, I'm wondering, Mr. Moderator, if there's any way for the previous speaker or architect to address whether this 50 grand is going to go to what he wants it to go to, or whether it's going to go to this, whether, whether this meets his needs of a, of a general design overlay, uh, this seems to be much more specific and not what he would like to vote for. I'd like him, I wonder if there's a way for him to address that. Um, if somebody raises their hand and I call them, they can address it, nobody's required to. Uh, I wasn't exactly clear who you were even asking for. Um, <laughs> But I see a green card right in the center there. Uh, Ruth Hazard, Precinct Three. I'm going to I'm going to vote in favor of this. I, it may not be perfect, but I think that to say that these are are overly specific. When I read them, I'm, the only thing that seems really specific is that the third floor would be a, uh, a meeting space as opposed to stacks. Other than that, there's actually a lot of flexibility in this, this design, and I think it would move us forward in giving a vision and an understanding and a design for how these needs could be met in the existing building. I think that in, in itself is a worthwhile accomplishment. It doesn't mean that we couldn't also, or in the future, say, you know what, we'd really like it to be bigger. Let's get another, let's go again with a design that, that meets, because we have other needs. But the, it would allow us to preserve that building as it is and make it f serve the functions that it needs to serve. We're just making a plan. We are, that plan will then go back into the JCPC process. Or 
it might open the door to some other sources of funding that are not available until we have a plan. So I don't see any real downside of voting this and going forward with it. It moves the whole thing forward, which is so important. I'm very grateful to the people who brought this petition because it is an important part of our government process here. And let's respect that. Let's honor it. Let's try it. Um, yes, second from the aisle right there. Um, Andra Rose, Precinct 4. Um, so I'd like to hear um, from the petitioner what kind of input you got. Can I ask that? I, I, I just want to know what process it did go through because it does seem a little problematic that it's so specific and it does say to include, you could include other things as well, but if it has to, I, I, I'm, I'm just not sure that's what everybody needs. So. Um, if, I don't know where the petitioner is sitting. Right oh, there you go. So if, if, did you raise your hand? Yes. So you've been recognized. It's Holland. Uh, it's an interesting question that you um, asked. I'm sorry, you still have to identify yourself. I'm sorry, yourself. yes. Yes, I'm, I'm Patricia Holland, Precinct 1, and the petitioner, among a group of us. Um, and this group has been um, meeting together now for um, close, to a, is it close to a year, maybe nine months, something like that, um, and sort of brainstorming what we would like to have in that library besides the most obvious thing, which is accessibility. Right from the start, it was that we need an elevator. There's no way else to have that building accessible. And then we remembered that the bathrooms don't, aren't for the public. The one bathroom isn't for the public. And then it was we looked into the library and, and looked more carefully at the basement area, which I've seen before. And by the way, I used to be a Jones Library trustee. In fact, I was president of the Jones Library trustees for two years, I guess it was. Um, so I'm, I'm familiar with, with libraries. Um, and as we looked at it more closely, we realized there's a lot of usable space in that library. And that's why we talked about making that top floor um, available too, accessible too, because it could be used for all sorts of things, actually, not just for meetings, but for gatherings of any kind. And there is a shortage of such places in North Amherst now, as you may know. Thank you. Um, yes, way over against the wall there. John Michaels, Precinct 10. I call the previous question. Second. Motion the previous question has been made and seconded. If two thirds of you vote yes, we will then come to an immediate vote on the main motion under Article 14. All those in favor of the motion for the previous question, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say no. No. Moderator, here's two thirds. We now come to a vote on the main motion before you on the screen for Article 14. This requires a majority. All those in favor of the motion under Article 14, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, please say no. No. Um, Moderator, here's a majority, but we're going to have an electronic vote. We have 100 yes and 73 no. Article 14 passes. We now move on to Article 17. So I write this down. Okay. 
And I call on Alice Swift to make a motion. Alice Swift, Precinct 8. I move in terms of the article. Motion's been made and seconded. You may speak to your motion. Good evening. My name is Nadine Shank. And I appreciate I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just, I should um, recognize you to speak, actually. So Ms. Shank is um, speaking. She's the petitioner, and she's making the statement. So now you may proceed. I appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight about Article 17, which is a non-binding resolution for the Amherst Town Meeting to call on the state legislature to pass the End of Life Options Act and make Massachusetts the seventh state plus Washington, D.C. to allow citizens to request and receive compassionate aid in dying medication from their doctor. I'm a longtime Amherst resident. Some of you may know me through my work at UMass, where I've been a piano professor since 1980, or you may know me from local gyms, where I teach aerobics and spinning classes. For many years, I have been a firm believer in allowing medical aid in dying to people who are terminally ill and are also desperately seeking relief from unremitting physical pain. Like me, many of our local citizens wish for and seek legislative action to permit this. In a short time, I gathered 142 petition signatures, and many more people wish to be added to the list. In 2012, Amherst voters voted over 72% in favor of a statewide referendum to approve medical aid in dying, feeling that no one should be made to suffer needlessly and should be allowed a death with dignity. Two weeks ago, the Northampton City Council unanimously approved such a resolution. My 98-year-old mother, Jerry, who lives alone with my assistance and has survived breast cancers and a stroke, actively worries that her life could end slowly in terrible pain and with no quality of life and that her only choice would be dehydration and starvation. Dying from such self-induced renal failure could take five to 15 days. Regarding the Hippocratic Oath, some doctors feel that patients are harmed when they are forced to endure unrelenting pain while waiting for an inevitable death. If this End of Life Options Act were made law, doctors would be able to end the continuing harm to their patients by helping the mentally capable patient die in her own time and on her own terms. Annual public health data in Oregon and Washington shows that of every thousand people who die, four have requested and been approved to use this option. Out of that number, one-third of the terminally ill people don't end up taking the medication, but are greatly comforted just knowing that it is legal to avoid a protracted, painful dying process. There are many safeguards in the End of Life Options Act, which are listed in Article 17. The patient must be able to take the medication themselves. The terminal illness, six-month prognosis, and mental capability to make an informed health care decision must be confirmed by two doctors, both licensed All right. Uh, both are licensed in medicine in the state of Massachusetts. First, the attending physician, who has primary responsibility for the person's care, and a second, a consulting physician qualified by speciality or experience to make a professional diagnosis and prognosis regarding a terminally ill patient's condition. Patients are not eligible for medical aid in dying because of age or disability. The attending physician must inform the requesting patient about all of their end-of-life care options, including hospice and pain and symptom management. Medication can't be prescribed until mental capacity is determined by a mental health professional. Two separate requests for the medication must be made, one oral and one written, within a 15-day waiting period between the first and second request. 
A retired emergency physician, Dr. David Nielsen, an Amherst resident, recently wrote a letter to the editor of the Hampshire Gazette. In it, he wrote, I can personally attest to the anguish and unnecessary suffering of dying patients who are denied death with dignity. I feel it only humane to maximize our options as we each traverse this final rite of passage. No one should be made to suffer needlessly, waiting for the merciful release of death. So I and my fellow petitioners and countless others hope that you will vote yes at this town meeting and show our state legislature Amherst's support for this End of Life Options Act. Thank you again for allowing me to speak tonight. Thank you. The select board, Mr. Slaughter. The select board uh, voted to take no position on this article, and although each of us has our own opinion, we decided that as a board we would not take a position. Thank you. And it's my understanding that the Finance Committee also has no position, is that correct? Um, this is a resolution, requires a majority vote for passage. Is there discussion before we come to a vote? Um, yes, I see a hand back there. Helenberg, Precinct 1. Um, it's difficult to live, and it's difficult to die, too. And I've been beside people that have, in my family that have died and have suffered. And they've suffered because doctors have done harm and not prescribed adequate pain medication. And there's now a so-called opiate crisis now where we're denying people pain medication. I, I, I just don't understand. The state can't get rid of people fast enough. It's like the Veterans Administration is trying to do the veterans. They're trying to vet the lists, the, the roles. And the, the state wants to, I, we've grandfathered in mass health for another eight years or so, because it was bought out for 62 million, or billion, or whatever. The state would like to take a lot of us out. And we're going to give them that? Living is precious. We don't know what's on the other side, if anything at all. Now, maybe you do. I don't. Yes, I see a white card there in the fourth row. Joan Temkin, Precinct 8. I have a question. Um, the petitioner talked about the long process that is necessary to obtain permission. And it made me wonder, because um, there are a lot of professionals involved in that decision, um, who pays for that? How, how is all of that funded? Is that through the hospice thing, or do you know? Ms. Shank? I would suppose that uh, going to the doctor would be like any of us would, with regular insurance coverage, Medicare or whatever, you know, to just go to the doctor and, and request their opinion and uh, diagnosis. Further discussion before we come to a vote? Um, yes, third row right here. Uh, Frank Addy, uh, Precinct 8. Um, I'm opposed to the um, article uh, with some considerations. Um, uh, one is the concern about money. That is, it seems like there would be pressure on people who would be facing medical bills that, and that would be both the care of the illness and the need for supportive people to help them to stay alive, and therefore in the interest of their loved ones, in the interest of being able to have something passed on from them, there would be a pressure to try to get it done, uh, and therefore it is difficult for people without resources and easier for people with resources under these circumstances. Also, the medical profession is in itself reforming. That is, at UMass, um, they have a course for medical students before they actually have any clinical knowledge. They're for freshman medical students. And they become 
uh, people who will spend time with a dying person and their family throughout the process of dying and then for some months after the death. Uh, and that leads to also the new specialty of palliative care in which a team of people are working together to no longer cure the illness, but to uh, help the quality of life in the last days and months uh, of the person's life. So it's becoming less necessary. I do have objections to the ethics. I think doctors, uh, what was it, four to five BC, have been under the idea that one would not study or one would learn how to cause death that would be against the ethics of the profession. It feels that there is a loosening of ethics in general with psychologists and psychiatrists working on torture uh, as a uh, activity that they've been paid for. It would seem as if holding the line and saying there are just some things that doctors don't do is worthy and it would require study. That is, if you're going to be good at killing with uh, medication, you would want to study that, and it seems that that's not particularly an area to go into. And I would point out that um, uh, we are increasingly kind of unkind. Uh, if you heard the debates on uh, the Affordable Care Act, uh, it is that medicine is a business and needs to be run as a business. And it seems to me in that atmosphere, uh, one would wish to have somewhat rigid standards of what people do in the medical profession. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, just a second, no, not yet. Um, I see a green card on the aisle back there. Yes. No, 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 I'm sorry. I was behind you. Pat DeAngelis, uh, Precinct 6. Um, I, re I support uh, this resolution, and I think about three people in my life who have been incredibly important to me, uh, who made different kinds of decisions. My friend Olive lived until she was 93, and the last uh, five years of her life, she was in extraordinary pain. And she kept contemplating whether she was going to walk out into the snow um, to uh, freeze to death um, or starve herself or and she had no options and she lived much longer than she wanted to. My friend Kit at the age of 60 had Lou Gehrig's disease and with her family and friends around her she made a decision to take her mouth off her respirator and she chose her death and celebrated it. My um, <laughs> My brother-in-law, um, Dan, lived with prostate cancer and they diagnosed him eight years ago saying that he would live for three months. And he lived eight years longer than that. So all those three deaths swirl around me and I realize how important it is that the individual make the decision, uh, not the state, not but that we have the opportunity to choose and to choose uh, an ending that fits our lives and how we wish to end them or live them to the very end. Thank you. Um, and right on the aisle there, fourth row back. John Cool, Precinct 2. I urge you to vote for this. Uh, I'm going to die. I suspect all of us here are. A little control over that seems a small thing to ask. And the restrictions proposed in this resolution are very clearly meant to cover any, eliminate any abuses. I urge you strongly to vote for this. I think it's human, humane, and the way we should, as an advanced society, look at life and the end of life. Thank you. Are we ready to come to a vote? No, nope. I see a hand over here. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Peter Vickery, Precinct 2. It doesn't diminish compassion for those who are dying in any degree to have some compassion for two other groups of people. And that is um, one group that I hadn't thought about much until I did my research on this article. And those are the people who, uh, when they were asked why they were taking their lives in Oregon, uh, gave the reasons, and among those reasons were they didn't wish to be a burden. It wasn't the only reason, but it was one of the motive reasons. People who were opting for physician-assisted suicide in part because they didn't wish to be a burden. The other group is those who uh, choose to take their own lives without the assistance of a physician. As you know, we have about 30,000 gun deaths in this country every year. 20,000 of them are self-inflicted deliberately. 20,000 gun suicides a year. We have no shortage of suicide. And how many of those people uh, who survived suicide have expressed the feeling that uh, they regretted it once they had done the act. Those who've survived suicide uh, have said they regretted it once they had done it. How many of those who succeeded in the act could have been saved if the stigma had remained, if the taboo had remained, and this taboo is evaporating, this taboo against taking one's own life. It's a valuable taboo, and I ask that uh, we make a life-affirming decision tonight and help maintain, uh, maintain it rather than help it vanish. Thank you. Are you ready to come to a vote? I see no hands. So we will now come to a vote on the motion. Um, I don't think you need to if yeah. no one's raised their hand. Um, so we are going to come to a vote on the motion in terms of the article for Article 17. This is a resolution that requires a majority for passage. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, please say no. no. It has passed by a majority. Um, before I call on the select board to make a motion, a couple quick reminders. We still have a set of keys up here, so figure out if they're yours and come get them. And please clean up after yourselves. And now, somebody in the select board. Anybody? Mr. Slaughter. I move to dissolve the November 6, 2018 special town meeting. Motion made, made and second to dissolve town meeting, November 6, special town meeting. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, please say no. We are dissolved.